Thank you. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank Leanna, uh, the Center for Texas Studies, and also the Fort Worth Library for hosting these very important meetings. Uh, I have been following the program since I've gotten to TCU, and I'm honored to be here today. So I'm not a podium person. I hope uh, you don't mind. I'm going to move around. I wanted to start my talk today. Can everybody hear me OK, by the way? Yeah, everything coming through? Excellent. Thank you. I wanted to start my, my uh, talk today by sharing a little vignette of what happened to me in March of 2013. This is uh, shortly after I had received my offer to come to join the faculty at TCU, and I was very excited about that. This was my top choice. I wanted to come here. I thought the program at TCU in history, in particular in Latin American history, was one of the best in the country, and I was incredibly excited. I was a little bit worried uh, since I came from a, a program that specialized in Latin American history that when I would arrive to TCU that I would lack some of the resources that were essential for my research. In particular, I was looking for, slide, I was looking for a uh, language manual that was used during the 16th century uh, by Dominican friars to try to convert individuals to Catholicism. Part of the reason that this was important to me because uh, my research centered on indigenous maps of colonial Mexico, which would made some time between the 16th and the 17th centuries. And often they carried glosses in Mixtec. And I was not a fluent Mixtec speaker. In fact, I don't know it. But with these manuals that were prepared right around the same time, I believed that this was an essential tool for me to be able to interpret the maps that I was working on. The ones that I currently had were from the University of Arizona Library, which I was going to have to return as soon as I uh, graduated, which was an impending few months away. And I was curious to see if I could find uh, a modern edition of this particular work. It's Vocabulario en Lengua Mixteca, so vocabulary in the mystic language. It's almost like a bilingual dictionary, Spanish and Mixtec, that was produced at the end of the 16th century. Now, the original runs tens of thousands of dollars. I wasn't really looking for that. I was looking for a modern edition that would have been published perhaps sometime in the 90s or in the early 2000s. Now, even then, these books are incredibly rare, and I really did not believe that I was going to be able to find that book, but I typed it in in Google, and lo and behold, a few lines down, I find that a particular bookseller had it in its inventory. So I was intrigued, I immediately clicked, and sure enough, it's there, it was affordable, and I thought, I wonder, who this person is. This is a very rare book, and surely I didn't really expect to see it, perhaps in Mexico, and I thought I was going to have to shell out a lot of money. But then I came to find that this person was actually in Fort Worth, the very place that I was headed to. And so it was incredibly curious to me at that point my kids walked in, they started asking for all sorts of things, and I had to abandon the project. But I remembered the rare book curator in Fort Worth. I wound up not purchasing the book, but I made a note to make sure that when I arrived to Fort Worth and TCU, I could get a hold of this person. I had no idea who he was, but I knew that if he had that book, that there were going to be others similar to that. Fast forward to August of 2013. Now I'm in Fort Worth. I start teaching, and I remember the rare book curator. I wonder if he's still there. And I get in touch, and sure enough, I am able to speak to Michael Utt. Next slide, please. This was an unusual thing for me. I was used to booksellers who had physical shops, who had set schedules, who I could go at any time. But this was a slightly different thing. Michael worked out of his home. After we spoke, a very friendly gentleman I said, listen, I'd love to come to your shop. I'm new in Fort Worth. I don't have a car. I had moved out here uh, in anticipation of my teaching position, but my wife and my kids had stayed behind. So I had to, you know, rides, taxis, whatever I could. 
And Michael said, hey, listen, I'll come and pick you up. I live close by. Oh, I thought that's very nice, good. And he did, and I wound up encountering one of the most spectacular visions that I had seen before. Next slide. Because it's out of his home, next slide, that I found that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> For any person who loves books, Michael's is the place. I don't get any commission, by the way. I do this mostly because I appreciate all of the things that he has. Michael is not only a great book, rare book dealer, but he is also a great person, incredibly hospitable. I'll tell you a little bit about him. But it's in this first encounter that I had with him in late August, early September, that I started asking myself a number of questions. How is it that a gentleman working out of his house has access to such a wonderful and broad collection of rare books that run into the tens of thousands of dollars. Who does, he do, who does he do business with? Where does he sell? How do these volumes circulate? And what in the hell are these books doing in Fort Worth? That part, I had no idea, and I had questions about that because Partly my own interest, because I've always been interested in rare books. When I study the colonial period, print and manuscript culture are one of the things that I'm particularly fascinated by. I use these types of books to investigate aspects about how indigenous people and Spaniards and mixed race people engage with each other and negotiate into different political, economic, and social issues. And so, it was that encounter that really allowed me then to begin to establish a relationship with Michael. Michael is from Flint, Michigan. He spent uh, the last 50 years in Texas. He attended uh, in the 1960s Arlington State College before it was known as UT Arlington and completed a Bachelor in Arts and Latin American Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. He later attained graduate training under Spanish borderlands historian Donald Wooster at TCU, so he's also a horned frog. His wife Rita, a retired lawyer, is a proud Fort Worthian and a lovely person. In his professional life, Michael has run for local office, served as a political consultant, and worked in the hospitality industry for Sheraton before turning to the rare book trade in the 1990s. An early pioneer in internet-based sales of books, Michael realized early in his career that it was more profitable to operate without a formal shop like most rare book dealers, and instead he built a special space in his home to house his books, but also to host his clients. Uh, I hope that you could see, for instance, this very comfortable area with the lamp and the leather chairs. There's a little space over there for libations. So whenever I go to visit him, there's always nice beverages circulating for wonderful conversation. But most of all, it's the books. Um, Michael specializes uh, particularly in anthropology in the early Americas, in exploration and literature, and he is the world's largest antiquarian book dealer of works on chess. He works with high-end collectors, with regular customers such as myself who don't have deep pockets. Uh, he works with libraries and special collections. Among his clients, you can find the Vatican, Harvard University, Berkeley, LSU, and then locally in the Metroplex, he seems to work with everyone, UT Arlington, SMU, and TCU, where many of the books in his collection have now found a local home. He scouts his books in auctions through travel, 
but often people find him directly because he know that he specializes in these types of records and they wish for him to either appraise their collections or perhaps to sell them to him. In 1999, he formed part of the Texas Booksellers Association, an organization that started with five members and has grown now to over 100. And he is a proud member of the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America, the most prestigious organization dedicated to the promotion of rare books in the U.S. And in fact, what I want to focus on for the next few minutes is to think and contextualize how these books wound up in his hands. Where do they come from? How did they circulate? Who printed them? Under what conditions did they come to life? And what we'll find is that these books have a tremendously rich history. Particularly when we're thinking about Hispanic Heritage Month, these books predate U.S. presses, they predate often European presses. Many of the books that we find that had either circulated through his hands or books that are related to other books that he has have been around for generations, moving not only within Latin America but also the U.S. and Europe, making runs across the Atlantic. And so it's to that part that I'd like to turn to now. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I want to think and divide uh, my presentation into three parts. Um, I want us to think a little bit about uh, the books in the Spanish crown, that is how these books came into existence because the crown in effect regulated the production of books quite heavily. Um, there's also a very unique condition when we talk about books of the Hispanic world because when we think about books primarily, we think about them as printed objects, part of Gutenberg's invention in the late uh, 15th century. But in fact, in the Hispanic world, books are not limited to print. We have different types of books uh, painted in manuscript that were also very prominent and informed not only intellectuals but religious circumstances as well. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about the readers themselves. Who is it that's reading these books, but also what sorts of books could they read? Was everything permitted? What about books that circulated outside of the Hispanic world? Who regulated readership? So I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about these things. Next slide, please. The very first press was established in Mexico City in uh, 1539 by a Dutch individual named Juan Kronberger. And he partnered with an Italian, Juan Pablos, at the urging of the Viceroy. Then Mexico was not known as Mexico, but it was known as the Viceroyalty of New Spain. It was a sort of semi-kingdom associated with the Spanish crown. There were two of them in the Americas in the 16th century. The Viceroyalty of New Spain, which encapsulated uh, most of the U.S. Southwest, all of Mexico, and then a large part of Central America and Northern Colombia, and the Viceroyalty of Peru, which included what used to be the remnants of the Inca Empire. That's how politically the Spaniards divided uh, the new lands that they encountered. But from the very beginning of the establishment of the press, in part because of the arrival of missionaries, of bureaucrats, of conquistadors, of individuals who were accustomed to reading and who were anxious to access books, we have the establishment of a press that becomes quite active by the second part of the, seventh, of the 16th century with seven booksellers publishing over 180 titles within a short period of time. That's comparable in many ways to some of the major printing presses in Europe and certainly exceeds even some of the smaller places in Europe that were also printing. Next slide, please. So I want to think a little bit about um, 
the types of books that we encountered. Some of the books that I'll show you are not books that we have here. I thought I'd mix it up for you so that you could see a broad array of what actually is printed and circulates in the Hispanic world. I think that that is one of the richest portions of this particular history that we're thinking about. As I had mentioned before, when we think about books in the Hispanic world, we don't limit it to print, but in fact, we want to think much broader than that because there are different considerations, and I'll talk to you about how that functions. Next slide, please. So with printed books, we want to think roughly about two types. Just like we have now, when we go to any bookstore and we can access a section on fiction, on romance, on mystery, on espionage, on literature. There were different types of books in the Hispanic world. Printed books I've categorized into two broad categories. Vernacular, that is non-religious books that included works on poetry, they included works on history, they included romances such as, uh, in, in, that you might be familiar with, um, you know, the legend of uh, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, those sorts of things. And next slide, please. There we go. Excellent. I want to show you one particular early work that circulated back and forth across the Atlantic with many of the men who came across to explore these new lands, the so-called conquistadors, the tale of Amadis of Gaul, Amadis de Gaule. This is one of the books that became one of the best sellers in the Hispanic world early on. It told of an errant knight who traveled from Spain to England and who got into all these adventures and overcame all sorts of obstacles. Now you could see the appeal for many of these men who were traveling abroad to new lands that were barely being uh, uncovered by European eyes, that were barely uh, being known in terms of people and material goods and natural culture. And it's a book that we see moving across in ship logs. It's a book that we know circulated widely in part because the Crown eventually became so preoccupied with the circulation of this work that they prohibited it. We don't want certain types of books, vernacular and romances, and then specifically, such as Amadis of Gaul, traveling to the New World. We don't want to see them in private libraries. We don't want to see them in convents. The crown was worried that these books would fall into the hands of the indigenous elite. They quickly learned that Indians were not barbaric creatures as they had first painted them out to be. That in fact, they were very smart, that very quickly they learned how to read and write, not only in Latin, but also that they began to write alphabetically in their own languages. And so that particular aspect worried the crown very much and they prohibited works such as this. Next slide, please. But it didn't end there. Histories were very popular at the time. Histories about the conquest in particular. There are several works that circulated very widely. One of them is Bernal Diaz del Castillo, The True Conquest of uh, Mexico. But this other work is a little bit less known, in part because the individual who produced it, Lopez de Gomara, he actually never traveled to New Spain. And he did not participate in any of the expeditions of conquest, like his forebear, Bernal Diaz. But, he was secretary to Hernán Cortés, the individual who was credited with defeating the Aztec Empire, and as such wrote a history that was very favoring of the old conquistador. But it painted the conquistador in such a light that it painted the crown in a negative one. And so they prohibited works such as this as well. Next slide, please. 
If we think about the other category that I've developed, religious books, this is where a majority of printing presses produced books, religious books of many different kinds, missals, sermons, catechism, conversion manuals, all sorts of different types of books that were printed for religious purposes. The Crown was very interested in these, in particular because they used religion as the main objective for their presence in the New World. So for the Crown, part of the reason that they even had a presence in the Americas had to do with the fact that Indians did not practice Catholicism. And so, as good Christians, they used that as the primary motive. Well, we need to introduce them to Christ and Catholicism, and we're going to do that by publishing a number of different types of religious works that will not only ennoble the Indians, but will heighten the status of everybody else. And so we have a broad category of these types of works. Next slide, please. I want to show you a couple of examples here. For instance, I had mentioned that works that combined uh, Spanish and different indigenous languages were very popular. This particular manual published in Mexico in the second half of the 16th century is from the region of Oaxaca in southern Mexico, uh, also uh, having to do with the mystic language. Part of the reason that works like this existed were that, was that for missionaries to be able to evangelize directly in the languages of indigenous people. But since many of them did not know how to speak those languages, they needed manuals such as these. You'll notice that, for instance, in this manual, what you have is an illustration in the center, and you've got two glossed portions, one on top and one on the bottom. And so how these would function would be that they would be used with uh, indigenous neophytes who they were trying to convert. They had the Mishtek portion written on the top, and then they had the Latin meaning at the bottom. In this case, we're thinking Led Zeppelin, Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> Next slide, please. This particular work, also printed by the same individual, uh, a man with French origin who had migrated to Spain and then eventually made his way all the way to New Spain, printed another uh, similar conversion manual, in this case for the Chocho language, uh, right around the time of 1580. I was particularly struck by the beautiful illustration that I can just kind of barely distinguish here, but it's very nicely colored in, I think by hand afterwards, uh, because I haven't seen plates like these uh, in the early 16th century, uh, and also because of the outlines indicates that somebody came to color it in later. But it's another beautiful example of the types of works that were printed in Mexico during this early time. Next slide, please. And then lastly, for these religious books, uh, there is a very large corpus of musical works that scholars had just barely, within the last five to ten years, have started to really explore. This is a gradual that has uh, musical notation and uh, portions of what needs to be sung during the masses. TCU, in fact, owns a similar piece, uh, but published in Spain. This was published in New Spain. It was published in Mexico by the same individual, by Ocharte, in the second half of the 16th century. As you could see, the broad nature of religious works really extends into various fields. Next slide, please. One of the very curious aspects of this history of books in the Hispanic world has to do with manuscript sources. But let me give you also a little bit of background. I've already told you that printed books focus primarily on religious themes. 
That is correct. What happens after that, especially with rival um, kingdoms who are jealous of Spain's expansion into the New World, who are jealous about the access that they gain to all the mineral resources that they find in New Spain and Peru, first gold, then silver, but also natural resources. That creates a sort of propaganda uh, from northern European Protestant uh, kingdoms who begin to portray Spain in a negative light, backward, conservative, in part because they see that what they're doing is strictly based around religion. To a certain extent, that would be correct, but that would ignore all of the dozens, if not hundreds, of books that circulated in manuscript form. Why do they circulate in manuscript form and why aren't they printed? A couple of reasons. For one, Spain realized their position within the 16th century political condition of Europe, and they did not want to give away their secrets. If they printed books and maps, for instance, then that means that they would circulate and their rivals would be able to access all that information freely. But if they produced say scientific works or maps by manuscript and limited the number of copies, in their view, that would allow them to control the very valuable knowledge that they were extracting from the new world. And so we see a number of different scientific works, very advanced for the time, that circulate not in printed form, but in manuscript form. Next slide, please. One of the richest works that comes out of this period was produced by a Franciscan missionary known as Francisco de Sahagún. Sahagún put together a 12-volume history of Mesoamerica that brought together discussions not only about history. History is, is the term that was used, but it really doesn't encapsulate all that he did. Because aside from thinking about the history of the Aztecs, he's thinking about animal life. He's thinking about plants. He is writing about medicine. He's writing about colors and how they're produced. He's writing about a number of different things, and he puts it together in manuscript form. But not only that, one of the other unique aspects of working with manuscripts, and especially with people like Sahagún, is that he's also able to recruit indigenous intellectuals to help him prepare these works. And so you see, for instance, on the right-hand side, we've got two columns. Left-hand column is written in Spanish. Right-hand column is written in Nahuatl the lingua franca of Mesoamerica. That is the language that was most widely spoken in Mesoamerica at the time of the arrival of the Spaniards. Nahuatl was the language that the Aztecs, that's a, really a misnomer, they would have considered themselves Nahuas or they would have considered themselves Tenochka. But in the 18th century, French travelers uh, desiring to gain more power over the New World invent the term Aztecs and call these people Aztecs. In this case, what we have is a dual language manuscript that is speaking directly about Spanish and indigenous traditions. And not only that, but he, in addition, hires indigenous painters to help illustrate what it is that they're putting together. And so you see, for instance, illustrations about medicine in the top right-hand corner, illustrations about the movement of the stars in the bottom right. Next slide, please. This tradition of, uh, no, go back one. There we go. 
This tradition of manuscript writing did not end in the 16th century. It continued well into the 18th century. Uh, little known work uh, by a, name, na a man named Juan Caballero, also another um, Dominican missionary in the area of Oaxaca, put a similar treatise on plants that he also wrote by hand. Next slide. And then, even beyond that, there are instances where vernacular prose and poetry is being collected and also written by hand. Uh, this particular work that you see here is a study of old proverbs that circulated in the Hispanic world during the colonial period. By the time that it's compiled towards the eight uh, the late 18th century, these sayings have been circulating for years and years. Uh, these are called decimas in part because of the meter that they follow. They're a sort of poetry and refranes. I'm not exactly sure how you translate into Spanish, but these are sayings that people knew. And then uh, these individuals would capture them. In this particular case, a military general who somehow had access to this knowledge put it together in writing, but also illustrated it at the top. One of the curious things that I found, this is a recent purchase that we've made at uh, TCU for our special collections, but one of the interesting things that I found when researching the history of this particular manuscript work is that during celebrations, during festivities, typically on saints' days and the like, especially at night when people would gather, musicians would come in and then you would have like rap competitions. Individuals who accompanied by music would lay down their rhymes and compete with each other to see who could put together the best rhymes based on these refranes, based on these sayings. Next slide, please. The last type of book that I want to discuss has to do with painted manuscripts. Now, why am I making a differentiation? They are also made by hand. These painted works were made principally by indigenous individuals, uh, and especially uh, either before contact, but also immediately after contact in the 16th century, but often even coming into the late 17th century. These also had very different character and themes. Some of them were astrological, some of them were historical, some of them were uh, genealogical, some of them recorded tribute, etc. Next slide. I've put together a collection here of uh, some of these painted works. On the left-hand side, we have a very famous leaf from what's known as the Codex Osuna. This is a representation of the mythical origins of the Aztecs. If anybody has ever studied Mexican history, the way that we learn it in school, uh, and I grew up in Mexico, that's why I say we, is that uh, the Aztecs moved from this mythical place called Aztlan, hence the term Aztec, to the south. And the legend goes that when they came across uh, an eagle standing on a cactus devouring a snake, that was the place where they were supposed to settle. I say legend because contemporary sources in the 15th century say, that's a bunch of poppycock. That's not the way that things really happened. In fact, nobody wanted these new group of people to come and settle in a very rich and fertile valley. And what wound up happening is that the Aztecs were pushed to the place where nobody else wanted to settle, a salt lake. And since they had no other choice but there, they built their city on a lake. Tenochtitlan, now known as Mexico City, and you see the foundational myth with the eagle and the cactus right there, going back to the early 16th century. On the top, on the right-hand side, that is a page from the Codex Columbino, 
that is a vellum deerskin uh, book fold out similar to what we have up here which you'll be able to see shortly that detailed the accomplishments of a particularly successful political and military ruler of the Mishtex. And then down at the bottom we have a page from the Codex Azcatitlan from central Mexico. I love this particular piece for several reasons. Uh, and I use it in class often because it illustrates to me that very early encounter but from an indigenous perspective. Notice that very clearly you can identify the, uh, the Spanish warriors. They're all wearing their armor, they have their shields. One of them, if I'm not mistaken, is riding a horse somewhere here in the background. They've got a banner. But the image is much more representative than that. We've got in the background indigenous tamemes. These were native carriers that aligned with Cortes in his march towards the Aztec capital. When we think about the conquest period, we tend to think about these exceptional men like Cortes and Columbus and Pizarro who single-handedly defeated these very powerful empires when in fact they were able to do it in large part with the assistance not only of indigenous carriers but large numbers of indigenous soldiers. But notice two other curious things about this particular image. Notice who's at the very front of that procession all the way on the left-hand side of that image. While this is an illustration that's dominated by men, we've got a woman at the head of the line. That was Cortez's translator, companion, mother of one of his children, Malitzin, later known as Malinche or Doña Marina, in part because the Spanish couldn't pronounce Malitzin, so they decided it sounds like Malinche, so we're going to keep it there. But then notice another figure there that in some ways seems to be just a little bit out of place. Who is that person there? What is that person doing? Why does he seem different? Well, that happened to be one of the many African former slaves in this case who participated in the wars of conquest of Mesoamerica who were imported as slaves into the Americas early on and many of whom earned their freedom by participating with the Spanish in their wars of conquest. Next slide please. Good. So I want to think uh, about two more things. I want to think about who's reading and I want to think about who is policing what people read. And as you may have guessed already, readers take very specific shapes. It's particularly the elite. It's especially clergy members from bishops and archbishops to local priests and certainly missionaries, but also well-to-do merchants, politicians, uh, bureaucrats, individuals such as that. <coughs> Next slide, please. I want to show you some evidence of readership because these are very interesting. At least they are to me when I see books such as this, a treaty on Aristotle that an early 16th century reader annotated in all of its pages. Not one single page out of that book does not include an annotation from this particular reader. Sometimes it's corrections, sometimes it's a very angry response to something that he's writing where he says no and it's in big bold block letters. <laughs> sometimes it's a cool little face peeking out at you 
And there are illustrations. I could have spent a whole talk just talking about this particular book just because of the richness of the person who read it and annotated completely. Next slide, please. Readers also came in other shapes and forms. Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, one of the most prominent intellectuals to come out of Mexico during the colonial period, was renowned for her library. She had ex an, extension, an extensive collection of books that included prohibited books, it included philosophical treaties, it included scientific treaties, as well as religious treaties. She was a poetess, she, was a, uh, she wrote plays, she played music. Truly, truly a savant during this time. Whenever we see portraits of her, she is typically portrayed with her famous library. She is one of our prototypical readers of the time. Next slide. And then finally, I want to share a different type of reader. This is a case that's been intriguing me for a little while now. On the left-hand side, you see a title page that accompanies this work on natural history. In fact, the original work was produced uh, in manuscript form, just as I had mentioned before, by a Spanish physician known as Francisco Hernández. Hernández spent about eight years in New Spain cataloging plants and their uses. He traveled throughout central Mexico extensively. He tried to engage indigenous people as much as possible to tell him about the properties of plants. But then he complained. You know, these Indians, they tell me one thing and I find out that they're lying. That that's really not what the plants are used for. There was that dichotomy in assimilating nature, but also being really able to capture it. And Indians placed barriers on the type of knowledge. In any case, Hernández put together this massive volume in manuscript form that when it got to the king, it didn't go anywhere. It was never published. It just stayed there in vaults secretly. But then it began to circulate, which is how these works took place. Somebody had access to it, copied it, then somebody copied that, et cetera, et cetera. And then since the 16th century, when he originally wrote it, it started appearing in print. This particular edition was published in the 17th century, right around the middle of the 17th century. Now, what does this have to do with readers? As I was looking at this book several years ago in this beautiful uh, Dominican library in Oaxaca, I came across a most interesting thing. Inserted, hand-sewn, and this is a book maybe larger than this one, you'll get a chance to see it shortly. Inserted within the pages was a folio that was sewn into the book, a portion of which you see here. Notice that it's handwritten and that it has a little stamp on it. And the folio recounted the birth of a two-headed child in the 18th century and how, when it was born, it was still born. Uh, the physicians conducted an autopsy. But this was such a unique event that took place that one of the priests felt compelled to write the account. In the handwritten account, we find out that the corpse was then sent to the viceroyalty, who would that, to the viceroy, that is the person in charge of the viceroyalty, who at that point was somewhere in Veracruz. He saw it, he was fascinated by it, he ordered it to go to Mexico City, where the corpse was then placed on display for people to come and see. But where do you archive a document such as that? For this particular priest, he didn't have an entry that said monstrous creatures, which is how they classified these sorts of things. So instead, he went to a book he knew, the work on plants and treatises. He found the section on bicephalous creatures, and right next to it 
he inserted his manuscript page. Next slide. Two quick notes here to talk about that also tell us about readership. One of the unique things about books in the Hispanic world is not only how they circulated, but who owned them, which also leads us to conclude about the type of readership. And one of the ways that we see that is by these particular items known as marcas de fuego, firebrands. That is, ownership was established by a hot iron placed on the sides of a book. And we have hundreds and hundreds of examples of these. And traditionally, these types of firebrands were associated with specific convents, but they allow us to trace the circulation of books across space and time, books that come from Europe, books that are printed in Mexico. Next slide, please. Books that circulate throughout. You'll see that they have different uh, designs. In this case, an Augustinian uh, firebrand which also, the fact that there's two of them, lead me to believe that this book changed hands within that same period of time between a couple of different convents. We see, for instance, that in the gloss, both on the right and the left-hand side, which is amplified, this belonged to a convent in Puebla, an Augustinian convent. Next slide. And then finally, to wrap up, I want to think a little bit about uh, censorship, because this is an important aspect of the Hispanic world. The Inquisition was the institutional arm of the crown that ensured that certain types of books did not circulate. You see that in one of, they published continuously these indexes of prohibited books. You see that in one of them, one of the illustrations is in fact a bonfire with fed by, in this case, books. We've got two types of censorship that we can think about here. One is complete prohibition, that is the work entirely is not allowed to circulate. And then another one is expurgation, which means that only a portion of the book is prohibited. Next slide. Certain works, especially by Protestant authors, were banned entirely. That's not to say that people did not own them. In fact, many people owned them, which is partly why they were so dangerous. The crown didn't want these people to be influenced by these Protestant authors or these godless intellectuals who didn't really have a well-centered uh, base within faith and reason. And so we see individuals, both philosophers and religious scholars, who were completely banned in the Hispanic world. But as I mentioned before, people such as Sor Juana and then other, countless other individuals who collected books during this period were persecuted in part because of the books that they had in their collections. Next slide. I showed you two works early on, Amadis of Gaul, which was early on prohibited. Next slide. And then also Francisco Lopez de Gomara, who was also prohibited. Next slide. But this is an example of how a book would have looked after it was expurgated. That is, after it was inspected by an inquisitorial official. And then when that individual determined which parts of the book were not permitted, he would then go ahead and wipe them out. Now, in this case, it's hard to tell, but this is actually a sheet of paper that was then uh, colored in with ink and pasted on top of the portion. You see that happening in the top, in the bottom, and in the middle. Right at the very top on the right-hand side, I can't quite make out what the person is trying to say. It says, esto no se borra. So it's either, I can't erase this, or, I made a mistake, this actually shouldn't be erased. <laughs> um, but in any case, we see here an example of how these expurgated works then circulated. Next slide. A few more examples. I was particularly taken aback by the 
uh, image on the bottom right and that entire page completely blacked out. Uh, but you see evidence here of the inquisitor who's writing and saying, yes, okay, I've read the book, I've made sure that the prohibited sections have been crossed out, we're good to go. Next slide. And finally, I want to bring back our talk to where we started and then shortly turn it over to Michael and invite you to come and take a look at these wonderful books. And that is to think about how these books then circulate after their first life. Books are meant to provide a, a certain knowledge for a particular period of time, but then books begin to circulate outside of their original context. Books uh, are collected by individuals, by institutions, by dealers, uh, and they continue to move not only within the regions where they were printed, but outside of those as well. Uh, one particular figure who I'm particularly interested in is this gentleman named Lorenzo Botturini. He was an Italian who traveled in the 18th century in the Americas, felt enamored not only with the land, with the Virgin of Guadalupe, but also discovered Mesoamerican antiquities, and he thought, this is what I'm meant to do. I'm meant to write the history of this place, but I noticed that others haven't written it based on original sources. And one of the things that he does is he begins to amass the largest collection of Mesoamerican and Mesoamerican related books and manuscripts, hundreds of them. He's not alone. Closer to our own time in the 19th century, John Carter Brown, who now has a library, a wonderful library named after him at Brown University, was also a big collector of Hispanic American books. And then even closer in the later 20th century, a Florida businessman named Jay Kislak, who also amassed a broad collection of books on Mesoamerica in the early Americas. His collection is spread out between the Library of Congress, the University of Pennsylvania, and some other institution that I can't quite remember right now. Uh, we find many of these books circulating, especially in the U.S., in places like the John Carter Brown Library in Berkeley, at the University of Texas in Austin at the Benson Latin American Collection, at Tulane University at the Latin American Library, and smaller collections spread out through different places, including SMU, UT, uh, San Antonio, uh, University of Arizona, UC San Diego, but these books continue to move back and forth and circulate. I was especially pleased to learn when I got here that Michael places many of these wonderful and rare pieces within the Metroplex itself. That, for our history and for our culture, I think is tremendously valuable. 